I was in Uganda four years ago, and I remember on a clear day seeing these big mountains on the horizon, and I asked what they were, and my friend said, oh those, those are the Ruanzori Mountains. When Neil asked me whether I'd heard about the Ruanzoris, I remember thinking, yeah, actually, I have. I spent my childhood in Nairobi, and my dad had climbed the Ruanzoris in the 1980s, and so I remember seeing his photos and hearing about their adventure. In 1988, I had an opportunity to climb in the Ruanzori Mountains with a climbing group. Very few people know about the Ruanzori Mountains. They're, first, they're inland. Um, they're in a more remote area. For most of recorded history, the Ruanzoris have been a pretty mysterious place. Ptolemy, the ancient geographer, wrote that the Nile River originated in the so-called Mountains of the Moon in Central Africa, but it was almost 2,000 years before any European actually saw the mountains. Everything about the mountains defied expectations. They're taller than the Alps or the Rockies, but they almost never emerge from the clouds. They're on the equator, but they have glaciers at their summits and most of the plants and animals that you find there can't be found anywhere else in the world. As biologists, as photographers, we just had to see this place. As we were reading about the Ruanzoris, there were a few phrases that kept coming up. Global warming, climate change, glacial retreat. The glaciers of the Ruanzoris were already 80% smaller than they were a century ago, and some scientists were estimating that they would be completely gone in less than 20 years. If we were gonna see this place, we had to go soon. And we had the opportunity to share this place with other people before the glaciers were gone. But how do you show people what glacial retreat looks like? In 1906, the Duke of Abruzzi, a guy named Luigi di Savoia, led the first expedition to summit the Ruanzori Mountains. The Duke of Abruzzi really wanted to show the world places that they'd never seen before. And so on this expedition, he hired Vittorio Sella, one of the best photographers of his day, to document every aspect of the expedition, including the famous equatorial glaciers. If we could retrace the steps of this 1906 expedition and recapture Vittorio Sella's glacier images from the same visual perspectives, then we could show people how much this place had changed. Before we knew it, we were on our way to Uganda. With every step of our journey, we could feel ourselves getting closer to the mountains. But even when we could finally see the foothills, the big peaks stayed hidden. With all our climbing gear and cameras, we were gonna need porters and guides. That meant we needed the Bakonjo, because ever since the Duke of Abruzzi, the Bakonjo people have been the gatekeepers of these mountains. Today, every climber is required to have a guide and every Ruanzori climbing guide is Bakonjo. All right, we're finally underway and we're headed toward the Niabitaba hut. You start the climb and it takes you through a 10,000 foot elevation gain as you're getting into the mountain. It's a several day hike to get in, uh, so it takes you through so many ecosystems. Each day as we climb further, we move through new environments the montane forest zone, the bamboo zone, the heather zone. After the heather zone came the Afro-Alpine bogs, which is really where the environment starts to look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. You just look at the vegetation and it just feels like you're not on this earth. It's so different. The, the bogs and the mud in, in the Ruanzoris are notoriously famous. Anyone who's hiked them remembers them <laughs> vividly. Oh, this place is famous for its really deep mud and you kind of have to jump from these tussocks to tussocks. <laughs> Otherwise you're gonna get muddy. Anyways, it's gonna be a muddy day. Along with that, you have these uh, guides that are phenomenal people who are uh, just the toughest, some of the toughest people on earth. Victoria Sella had taken this amazing portrait of the Bakonjo porters who helped them during the 1906 expedition. And we had our doubts about recreating it. Uh, it just didn't feel right and we didn't want to offend anybody. Um, but when our porters saw that image, they got really excited about it and they wanted to recreate it to make a 2013 version. 
these guys are incredibly proud of the role that the Bokonjo have played in the exploration of these mountains. Three nights into the trip, the clouds were thick and we still hadn't seen the peaks that we were planning to climb. The Duke of Abruzzi was in the Ruins Ories for 40 days. Our trek was only 12 days long, so we only had time to summit each peak once. And we weren't just looking for a clear view to photograph, we needed to recreate specific perspectives. In his account of the 1906 expedition, the Duke of Abruzzi wrote, the one point on which all explorers agreed was the abominable weather encountered in the higher region, rain almost perpetual, rare clearances, and those only about dawn. Our first peak was Vittorio Emanuele, which is the high point on Mount Speak, and it's over 16,000 feet, so it's higher than either of us had climbed before. A few hours into the climb, the clouds came down, the wind started howling, and by the time we reached the summit, we could barely see each other, much less the peaks across the valley. Still, it was the highest either of us had ever climbed, so we called the day a success. Next up was Margarita Peak, which is the highest point in the range. We got an early start from Elena Hut through this just impenetrable fog. And by the time our feet hit the Stanley Glacier and it started to get light, we knew the clouds weren't going to break, but we needed to summit. On our way back to the hut, we saw something that was just amazing and terrifying at the same time. We've come across these ladders. Now, these ladders were originally put into place so that people could come off the Stanley Glacier and climb down onto the Margarita Glacier. And the very first one was put up there in 2006. They've had to add a ladder to the original ladder every single year since 2006 in order for the ladders to reach the Margarita Glacier. But now, even the last ladder no longer can touch any glacier because there's no longer any glacier here. In fact, the glacier has retreated about 30 feet up from where I'm sitting right now. The next morning at Elena Hut, the sky was all stars and we knew this could be our chance. So we, we geared up quickly and we headed out toward Alexandra Peak, which is the second highest point on Mount Stanley. Finally, we had a clear morning, but something was still wrong. We could find some landmarks, but not others, and nothing really seemed to line up. We had the 1906 images in our hands, but no matter where we went on the Stanley Plateau, Neil and I could not agree on the right vantage points to recreate those images. Eventually, we started to wonder, well, what if we were up there? In 1906, the glacier would have been a lot thicker, and the perspectives would have been different. If Vittorio Sella had set up his tripod on a glacier, maybe tens of meters above where we were standing, then there was no way we could get those perspectives. There was only one really good shot left, and that was the Edward Peak, which is the high point on Mount Baker. There are a couple of key images that were taken right from that summit. We got another early start and the sky was clear. Of course, we'd seen that before. As we got closer to the summit, the sky continued to look like it was gonna cooperate. When we reached the summit ridge, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. The valley between us and Mount Stanley was filled with clouds and that was the one photo that we wanted most. The rest of the sky was blue, but once these clouds come in, they usually stick around. We got to work recreating other photos from the Edward Peak, and suddenly the clouds were moving out of the valley, and there were no new clouds coming to replace them. In the end, we had just enough clear sky to recapture that one photo that we really wanted. We were in the right place at the right time, and we got lucky. The last night of our expedition, Everyone felt like celebrating, and our Bokonjo friends showed us how it's done in the Ruanzoris. Those images from Edward Peak really tell the story the best. I mean, we're standing there in the exact same spot as Vittorio Sella. It's the dry season in both photos. And yet, 
a hundred years later, it looks like a completely different mountain range. The Bakonjo know these mountains are changing. They see it every time they bring climbers into the mountains. And the irony is that they have almost nothing to do with the cause of the change. Uganda isn't an industrialized nation, but they're the ones who are seeing the climate change in their backyards, and it's gonna affect their livelihoods. The National Park protects these mountains from loggers, from poachers, but climate change is different. I was taken aback when one of our guides, Joseph, asked us, what can we do? What can we do to restore our glaciers? And we just had nothing to offer him because nothing the Bakonjo do is going to change what happens to these glaciers. But maybe we can learn from these mountains. Maybe, maybe we can change. A lot of times people think that, oh, you know, I'm only one in billion people, but a long journey starts with one step. If, if we want to save um, our world, that journey can start with one person. Do what is right, and maybe your family will follow suit, your clan will follow suit, your tribe will follow suit, and maybe your whole country will follow suit. It was an incredible privilege for us to see these glaciers, but when the ice is gone, people will still visit the Ruinsori Mountains. With or without glaciers, these mountains are unlike any place else. They are the mountains of the moon. <laughs>